Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 26 of Duke's Download. And uh, today, I am so excited to have someone who is not just an actor, um, but a barrier breaker and a dedicated activist um, for LGBTQ equality, um, Wilson Cruz, um, as our guest. Um, I've known Wilson for a few years, um, and I've always looked up to him. He's, he's on right now, actually, and uh, I'm so excited to talk to him. Acting. Should just take a second. Hey there. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for taking the time, seriously. I always forget that I'm on the bottom. <laughs> well, no, you you look perfect. You look a lot better than me. You get my so. head cut off. Here you're you're always like you're always perfectly you know presented, oh, I don't know presented and uh, no, you look awesome. So, um, how are you? I'm good. I'm really good. Um, you know, I uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially because I didn't realize that this Thursday uh, your new the new season premieres. Is that right? Yeah, it's craziness. I know it's it's bizarre to me because you know. Usually by this time, it's a flurry of activity of how to get to the premiere right. and what I'm going to wear and who's going right. to take the photograph and the makeup and everything. And now it's just like, I guess I'll wear a T-shirt tomorrow or something <laughs> that says vote on it. I don't know. Right. I'm trying to figure it out. Have you been um, doing, um, I assume you've been doing some virtual promotion, right? Or you will yeah, be? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, but not everything, everything has gone to Zoom, yeah. Right, exactly. We're doing our big um, Trek the Vote event tomorrow, actually. Right. Of course. Um, with five generations of Trek actors, uh, which is nuts to me. Unbelievable. Um, but we're going to be joined by like Stacey Abrams and um, I saw uh, Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Pete Buttigieg right. Right. Um, uh, Cory Booker um, may not come, but I think. Um, Ro Rosario Dawson is going to join us um, along with Julian Castro. Wow. And, oh um, and we just got word that special guest Whoopi Goldberg is going to make an appearance as well. Wow. So, that's yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, great. That, that's so cool. I mean, wow. But what back a, to your question. Yes. Um, Discovery premieres on Thursday, uh, the 15th, on CBS All Access. Um, and it's our fourth season premiere, and it's nuts to me. Wow, that's insane. I, I know can't believe I, it's been four years already. Four years. Now, I remember, of course, I wanted to ask you about this, that I remember when you announced that you were cast um, a, few, you know, a few years back, and you talked about how you were a fan of, you know, a big fan of uh, Star Trek going back to when you were a kid. And... Um, so, I mean, maybe you could just talk about, like, what that was like for you and, and uh, you know, when you, when you got the opportunity. Like, how did the show even come about or how did you come to get involved in it? Oh, me? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's in terms of, like, my awareness of Trek, um, you know, it really came through Next Gen. Like, that was, I was the right age. I was in my teens. Excuse me. Um, and I was hungry for some positive uh, sense of the future, right? Like I've always been kind of um, obsessed in a way with history, but also like our part in history and how we um, contribute to the future in the present day, um, how we set up for it. Anyway, so, you know, when I found Star Trek, it, w it was Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes and so, it was this incredibly um, idealistic view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about our show is that it continues along that same theme about um, the world that we would ideally like to create. Mm -hmm. But in this version of it, um, we, we know that it takes commitment to the work to, to create that future, that it doesn't just happen by osmosis, but that it, it, it is created through, as Dr. King said, through concerted effort, right? Um, you know, uh, that the... Um, in other words, that, it's not that, a, that, that, progress isn't that, a given. That progress doesn't come in on the wheels of inevitability. 
Mm -hmm. It comes in, uh, it, it, it happens through, through, um, uh, through action, basically, mm -hmm. to, to paraphrase him. Because uh, mm -hmm. apparently I can't come up with a quote right now. But, um, but anyway, that, that our show really takes that to heart, that it, is, mm -hmm. um, that it is effort on our part if we want to create that, that vision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I was thinking about the fact that, um, you know, how, how, and I don't know if it was an intentional thing or if it just, you know, for whatever reason happened this way, but Star Trek, I mean, the fact that you, you're an openly gay actor, your character is openly gay, and the fact that throughout the last, you know, 40, 50 years, Star Trek, you know, through Michelle Nichols, um, George Takei, has always been a super progressive, super you know, barrier breaking show. And I, I just thought it was so interesting that, you know, I guess it wasn't sort of an intentional thing. It just happened that throughout all these years up till today, um, the show has just always sort of served as, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a barrier breaker in terms of representation and diversity. Um, was that something that, like that you were conscious of when you took on the role or like, Oh yeah, I mean that comes from just, just because I'm a student of history and because I'm a you know a fan of the medium of television, mm -hmm. I was aware of uh, Star Trek's place in our history. You know, mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther King um, actually. You know, at one point, um, Nichelle Nichols wanted to um, to leave the show. She wanted to go pursue other things, um, and Dr. King actually pulled her aside convinced her to stay because he understood the importance of her visibility wow. um, and what she what she symbolized for her people and mm -hmm. and how necessary um, they that 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 representation was at the time mm -hmm. so 52 years later um, you know Star Trek had uh, you know dipped its toe a couple of times um, in, in, a, in metaphorical ways um, to deal to, 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 um, to, to deal with uh, gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until 52 years later that, um, that Anthony and I were cast as the first gay couple, as first real LGBTQ series regulars. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a pretty remarkable thing because I think the fans, you know, the LGBTQ fans have been hungry for that representation. They've been begging for it. They've been clamoring for it for, for decades. Um, and so it came, the, the gig came with a lot of pressure, right? We had to live up to the expectation. And mm -hmm. one thing that we all knew from the very beginning of all of this was that we, that, that their sexuality was just a part of who they were and maybe the least interesting part of who they were mm -hmm. or who they are, um, but that, they, that it was a fact and that they were together. Um, mm -hmm. And what I appreciated about the way it was handled was that they introduced us in our um, positions on the ship first and then revealed that we were a couple. Are you there? Right, so you were... Yeah, I think that was, that was a for momentary issue. <laughs> yeah. No, I heard you. So though, yeah. anyway, uh, so yeah, so that's how it all came up. Pretty amazing. Um, and wait, are you in Toronto full time then now? Is that for the last or do you ever could you come back here sometimes for other work? Um, or... I can't really say where I am right now, James. Okay. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> it's the worst kept secret in the world. <laughs> but um. I'm not in Los Angeles right now. I see. Okay. I am where I am when I'm usually not in Los Angeles. <laughs> I see. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, no, but it's like, aside from where you are. Um, oh, ridiculous. What, what, is, um, what has your life been like? I mean, like, I just know from, like, my mom, you know, having, you know, being a performer, how weird and different her life has been, you know, in the last 10 months you know, compared to her usual life and traveling and working. And I mean, I gather you're, you've still been working, um, you know, during yeah. this, like, when did you guys shoot the new season before COVID or, or during or like, okay, before? We had just finished, like literally. We finished at the end of February. 
Wow. And I flew to Los Angeles on March 8th and closed, March 9th, and closed the door behind me. Wow. That was it. And I was done. I slept so good. And by the way, I needed that sleep because we, at the, the end of a season is a monster of a schedule. So I was like, I'm turning this, these lights off. I'm going to get real comfy in this bed. Don't call me. You were done. You, know, you, were, you know where to find me. You were ready for like hibernation for a while. I full on hibernated. I'm not so kidding. So the timing, I mean, not that anyone wanted this, but in a sense, you were ready for some downtime anyway. I was prepared. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry under the circumstances yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that it was under those circumstances, but I was okay with a few weeks in bed. I'm not going to lie. Because I had just finished the season and then I went right into... Um, promoting the release of Visible on Apple TV. Which so I want to ask you about, of course. Finishing, I was finishing the season and promoting the documentary before its release. And then the release happened, so there was all of that. And then, here's the craziest thing that happened. I had been booked on a Star Trek cruise. <laughs> so I went. Wow. I went before I went home, the week, so there was a week between the, when we finished the season and when I flew home. And that week I was on a cruise ship. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I literally did the minimal public events I could do. Like I just, I was freaked out. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like then, the hardest place Because to by the way, by the way, I haven't really talked about this, but by the way, while I was on the ship was when that ship in San Francisco had that huge COVID outbreak and they wouldn't let it back in. So, you know, I was freaking out. <laughs> I mean, I can't even imagine. Oh my yeah. God. But Good luckily, stuff. as far as, I mean, you, did you, have, I don't know if you mind me asking this question. Have you, did you have COVID or? No, have you, okay. I have not. I have, I, I not. No, I just got tested yesterday again. So, so the, the ship, you got out of there safe, you were- Yeah, okay. because I stayed in my MF cabin. <laughs> and you were just great. Like, it was the, it was the rudest, I was the rudest Wilson Cruz I've rendition, a version of Wilson Cruz I've ever been. I was just like, hey, everywhere I went, I was like, I'm good, how you doing? <laughs> I mean, so you were you were you were really aware already. Like it was clear. Oh, I was this. aware and petrified. I was aware and petrified. Oh my god! So, um, but I, 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 it, it all turned out fine. And so, um, I mean, I know you've obviously been really busy with the virtual events for Biden, and I mean, obviously, you know, um, you'd be doing the promo. But have, did you, the last six months, have you, you have you worked at all? Have you gone back to work on anything? Or uh, I did it. I did my my favorite little game show with Meredith Vieira. Uh, I did two weeks on that. No, two days on that. That actually is two weeks. Um, but uh, but that was like a really you know it's really interesting the way they do that because every every individual involved in the game is mm -hmm. in their own little pod. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so nobody's ever in contact, and it was a whole thing. But um, so it's a completely different show now, um, in that way. Right. But um, but that's it. I was supposed to actually. I was supposed to work on one day at a time, which premieres tonight on the network, <laughs> and people need to watch it because there are no. I want you to. I want you to hear this. There are no Latino-led television shows on network television. Zero. So, um, I dare you to turn on your, your CBS tonight at eight o'clock, I think, or nine o'clock, eight or nine, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Check your mm -hmm. local listings. Um, but I was supposed to do an episode of One Day at a Time that Justina was actually going to uh, direct. And it was the very next episode they were gonna do and then they got shut down. So this will be my first time acting wow. when I go back to work. Wow. It's incredible. And, and so it's a, and, it, and it's a, apparently a completely different animal in in, in terms of the process and mm -hmm. how long and how slow it's going to go because you know what it was because you know the process was so fast before, right? You know. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know exactly what you mean. Um, no, I mean it's it's going to be a completely different world for a while. Uh, I'm I'm sure not you know, on so many levels, but yeah, but, and I'm okay with that. That's fine.
Yeah. You know, I want everybody to feel safe right. Right. and so that they can be as creative and capable of doing their job. Mm -hmm. All about it. Speaking of the Visible um, series, which you were, were you an executive producer or producer? I was. Right. Right. I was. I, I loved it, first of all, I just got to say, I, I, I was like totally, um, you know, captivated by it. And, you know, as, as self, whatever as this may sound, I consider myself like a pretty knowledgeable guy about LGBTQ history. And, you know, I've seen Celluloid Closet and all that. Yeah. But there was so much that I did not know, even about your story, because I thought, you know, I knew from a young age who you were. And I always looked up to you and you know, considered you a trailblazer and a role model. and. You know, but but there was so much about you that I didn't know, and I mean, I, I know it's a it's a big story, but maybe you can talk a little about because obviously I knew about the fact that you you had this historic role, first openly gay uh, character, recurring role on television, um, you know, being an openly gay actor. I, that was sort of the way I understood it, but actually, the story during the the filming of, of of it was a lot more complicated. And your personal story, maybe you can talk a little about that because it's pretty always more complicated, isn't it? Um, well, in terms of in terms of, of visible, uh, it was seven years of my life. Um, I was, originally I was just supposed to be interviewed for it, and um, when I met with David Bender, who was the person who created the concept, um, mm -hmm. he was like, I, "I, you know, everybody who who I need in the movie, and it's a passion of yours." So he brought me on as his exec executive producer then, and I thought it was just going to be like a year. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, seven years. That's seven insane. years later. Um, we released it. Um, and the reason why it's important is because, again, kind of like piggying back on what I was saying about Star Trek, which, by the way, my friend Amy just reminded me it's season three, not season four. Um, <laughs> but um, just like uh, what I was saying about Star Trek in terms of uh, the effort that it takes to create change, mm -hmm. I needed to document for this generation mm -hmm. who, ha who, who, are, who when they turn on their television, LGBTQ people are ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. But when, it was, when I was turning on the television in 1985 and 86, you know, we had three networks and you know, there, the depictions of LGBTQ people, if there were any, were, were problematic at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if I may just say so, really quickly, no, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, it's so true because I'm 28 and I can, I saw, I remember, I witnessed, I'm old enough to remember literally like 2009, 10, I think was a real turning point where like all of a sudden I saw with glee and all of a sudden there was this explosion of like, it became like, I, I witnessed the change where even when I was 14, even I, even people in my generation had to like go on YouTube to find like, you know, indie gay movies or, you know, like it was much, yeah. even within the last 10 years, there's been a massive shift so anyway but even so it's so fascinating how your generation my generation we all have like gone through different um you know uh our own different sort of experiences when it comes to that yeah that and 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 for me it was important to document how that happened because it mm -hmm. didn't just happen it happened because people took risks mm -hmm. and risked everything their mm -hmm. livelihoods their lives um in order to give a community that was in completely invisible mm -hmm. visibility so that people may, if given the opportunity, learn who we really are as opposed to these, uh, the falsehoods and, and um, lies that are told, that were, that were and continue to be told about LGBTQ people. But when you have, when you, when we know this, when, when you know someone who's LGBTQ, um, you are more likely to support us and our issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, 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 the movement identified television as um, a powerful way to um, educate uh, an ignorant population about LGBTQ people by introducing them in an empathetic way. Mm -hmm. um, but it took a long, it was a long <laughs> slope and slow slope up mm -hmm. uh, to that point. Um, there were um, really problematic depictions for many years until, until that happened. And so, you know, when, when you talk about an explosion of, of 
of um, characters and, and stories in 2009, 2010, for me, it didn't feel like, an ex it felt like, you know, a very slow trickle. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a bit of an explosion. And I, I really have to give a, a large part of, um, a, a large part of, um, of it to, to GLAD. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is an organization that, whose sole mission was mm -hmm to um, combat uh, the lies mm -hmm. that were being told about HIV and AIDS and gay men at the time, and then identify television as a way to be in the most intimate places in people's homes in order to have the most authentic and difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. um, because when you turn on your TVs, um, you know, you can, you can have that experience alone mm -hmm. um, and not feel judged for considering other points of views. Uh, so I wanted a documentary that really showed the scope from, you know, the, 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 the trajectory from invisibility mm -hmm. to visibility mm -hmm. to ubiquity. And the reason why that needed to, why we needed to tell that story was so that we could be vigilant mm -hmm. um, if and when someone tries to turn the clock back. Mm -hmm. Because I hate to report that <laughs> as, as long as it took us to get to the point where we were ubiquitous on television, it will, it will happen very quickly <laughs> when mm -hmm. the curtain comes down. Mm -hmm. um, so we needed to have that conversation. And you said that you learned a lot while you, while, you know, things that you didn't know, that you weren't aware of. I have to be honest, I, but there was stuff that I learned in making it. Mm -hmm. I had, I, there was stuff that I didn't know about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Mark Levine, um, who did the, um, they called them uh, snaps, where he would, um, zap, snaps or zaps, I can't remember now, um, <laughs> that, um, you know, he'd show up on Walter Cronkite, like he would come out of a closet oh, and, right. and, yeah, right. and like take over a, a television studio and, you know, and, and, and be on camera and asking for, you know, gay rights. And so he risked jail and his livelihood and nobody knew That's, about that it. That story was unbelievable. And, and when people talk about it, they were, you know, at the time they were like, you know, there was controversy because it was like, well, that's, that, how is that helpful? Well, I'll tell you how it's helpful. It starts a conversation, mm -hmm. and which mm -hmm. is all we wanted at the time. We didn't, you know, we weren't at the point where we were asking for marriage equality. We just wanted to be seen mm -hmm. and to be considered. Yep. And his disruption, his civil disobedience created conversations. Mm -hmm. And so, no, you know, we needed, we needed to tell that part of the story mm -hmm. and, and many other. But so then the, the, I thought the story of your sort of your personal journey that you went through while you were doing my so-called life, like maybe you can talk a little about that because I don't think people who haven't watched Visible yet, they may not even know that, be, that uh, be, uh, behind the scenes while you were shooting the show, that there, were sort of, there was a lot of sort of intertwining between what was going on in your personal life and what happened uh, to the character on the show. Yeah, it's always surprising to me. <laughs> When, when, when people are like, oh, I didn't know that. And I feel like I've been talking about it for 26 years. Well, I just mean the- <laughs> But no, no, I'm not, I'm not, but I don't mean that as in like you didn't know. I'm just, be, I just mean like, I feel like I talk about it too much. And no. you know, it's all surprising to me that, um, that someone hasn't heard about it. Um, but- um, I just mean, I don't, I think people are, I think of you as being a historic, you know, as a barrier breaking person, that character being a barrier, barrier breaker. I, but they may not know that you were going through sort of your own personal stuff uh, during that same period of time. I, I absolutely un understood what you meant. I, 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 I wasn't taking any offense. I was just saying that it's, I'm always like, oh, I hope I'm not boring people by telling them the same story again. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so when I was cast in my so-called life, I was only out to my friends mm -hmm. uh, in school and, and to like my aunt. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got cast in the show, I had made a, a pact with myself that if the show had, g gets picked up, excuse me, from 
you know, for the fall season that I would then come out to my parents because I knew that I wanted to have a public conversation about this character. And part of that conversation um, requires me to be out. And so I needed to come out to my parents first so they didn't turn on Donahue, which was a talk show, mm -hmm. you kids out there. Um, and, um, and so I told my mom and it went okay. Uh, not great, but you know, she came around. And, um, and on Christmas Eve, uh, I came out to my dad and it did not go well. Um, and he, and he kicked me out and we were estranged for a year. And, you know, I made my, I made my way, you know, I got, I found places to crash and I, um, I had three months just that I needed to get through. And so sometimes I slept in my car and sometimes I, um, I stayed at friends' houses on their couches or whatever. And meanwhile, you're, you're shooting a show. Meanwhile, well, we weren't you're... shooting that. We had just done the pilot and we oh, were so getting so. ready to start the season. Um, oh, so there was a three month window. Oh, I see. I see. Before we started. Um, and that's when all of that went down. So all of that to say that um, my father and I were estranged for that full year. And my character, Ricky Vasquez, also was kicked out of his house and, and experienced a, a similar um, experience. And so we did an episode in which he was kicked out of the house and my father actually had been watching the show. And which I didn't know because we never spoke. Uh, and the credits rolled on that episode and my phone rings and it's my dad. And, and he says, you know, we need to talk. And, and that was the beginning. And so when people say to me, um, you know, uh, my so-called life helped me, you know, Ricky Vasquez helped me or, you know, uh, I say to them, you know, I, I understand that because he helped me, right? He, he gave me my dad back. Um, so I understand when people say, you know, when people say this character means something to them because it meant something to me. Mm -hmm. It's almost like so. And by the way, my dad and I now are unbelievable. And he is, uh, a trip. <laughs> but, but I mean, what a mind blowing, like, uh, it's just so, so hard to like, it's so incredible. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it, I'll tell you what it allowed. It allowed my dad, uh, the show allowed my dad some distance, mm -hmm. some perspective. Mm -hmm. And that could be a gift, right? And what's, what's, crazy is that I still got to teach my dad, right? It wasn't me, it was me, but because it wasn't really me, right. he could take in the information mm -hmm. um, in a way that, that was a little safer maybe or accessible. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm really proud of him. I, I've, I have failed to say that enough. Um, I'm proud of him because, you know, my, my dad was born and raised in Puerto Rico, in, in the country, okay? They had dirt floors mm -hmm. um, and he had a minimal education and was highly influenced by uh, a, a male dominated culture mm -hmm. and a Catholic church influence and my dad, was able to find a way to love me through all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to dig up out of all of that nonsense mm -hmm. and in order to remember that he loved his son enough to let all of that go. Mm -hmm. And he's a hero to me in that way. So, Wow. I mean, you know, even, you know, it's, it's obviously very different, but in my, even in my case, you know, I mean, and look, I, I never thought my dad or you know, would throw me out, but 
you know, uh, you know, there was there was about a year where it was, you know, there was a there was a, it was a process of acceptance, and you know, so I mean, it's true. It's like when you reach the end of sort of that journey of like going through that period of you know of uh, you know, it's not just fathers. Adjustment. It can be mothers. Yeah, I mean, you know, parents in general. When you sort of get through that period, hopefully, if you if you do get through that period of sort of right. comfort, then you you then you really know how how. Uh, how how real and how powerful and how uh, right. genuine that love really is, you know? How, what, you, you, we get, <sighs> LGBTQ people are, are, are fortunate in, in, in a way, in that we get the opportunity to, allow our family and friends to show us unconditional love. Mm -hmm. We get to see it in action, right? Like everybody, you know, people, parents say that all the time. I love you unconditionally. We actually get to see it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, totally. I mean, look, like you said, I mean, with your dad, There's a, I mean, it's a silver lining is what I'm trying to say. It's a silver right. lining <laughs> around a really horrible um, experience. Totally. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I don't, I, I don't want to take too, too much of your time, but I do want to ask you, you know, because I know and one thing, one of the things I admire about you is that you are so vocal and passionate about politics and, uh, you know, as am I. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, as a gay man, as a gay man, uh, being a person of color, I mean, you have a sort of unique perspective uh, and being, you know, having been through this extraordinary life and, and, and journey. Um, do you, are you feeling sort of optimistic at the moment about, you know, not just with the election, but I mean, both, you know, with, with uh, like, what is your, how are you feeling in general about where things are going right now? A loaded question. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's a lot right now, right? So, how do I feel? I feel that I feel like we that 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 we are at a crossroads. I feel like I'm about to sing the blues, like you know, like railroad station. Um, but um we're at a crossroads and we have a decision as a people to make. Mm -hmm. And I think we really are deciding in November what direction this country is going to go in for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, I, I have, I am, I'm more confident today than ever that we're going to win. But I also just got off of a phone call where one of the campaign managers for Biden said, um, this time next week was when the Access Hollywood tape came out. And we all thought, well, that's the end of that. Mm -hmm. And then we know what happened. So we have to run through this tape. And we have to make sure that we show up and that we take five to 10 people with us. Mm -hmm. So you have to vote, mail it, show up on the day or drop it off. But that's not where your job ends. You have to make sure that five to 10 other people are doing the same thing. Um, but what's exciting to me is that if we get, if we, if we get this election right, I do really believe that there's an enormous opportunity to create, to get on the road, mm -hmm. truly, sincerely, mm -hmm. to the beloved country that Dr. King was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think we can start making our way there because I think there's an opening now. Um, and, you know, I, I worry. What, I worry, what I'm worried about, if I'm going to be honest, is not that we'll lose the election, but that it'll be taken from us. Because right. um, I lived through 2000. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I lived through 2004, which was, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, that's, right. I think I'm scarred from 2004, which was, you know, I was so sure mm -hmm. that after the, you know, the weapons of mass destruction BS, mm -hmm. that this country would fire the man. But here, mm -hmm. there we were. So anything is possible. And I just want to make sure that we are, every single one of us is doing every single thing we can and that we're running through the tape until November 3rd. And that now, we're holding strong yeah. through the end of the year. Right. We have well, that's funny them. because I actually wrote down in my notes here, you know, how, you know, I, I have, have said for a long time that my main, my, I was not so much worried about whether or not Biden would win, but that, you know, and this is not the way our system should be, but unfortunately it's like, it's not just good enough for Biden to win, apparently. It has to be decisive right. so that they can't, you know, file lawsuits. They can't, you know. And so, yeah, my concern has always been less that whether Biden will win, but that it would be so close that Trump would try to stay in office. And, you know, I don't know what that looks like, but I know this is, but this is not going in all likelihood unless it's a blowout to be right. a, but there's I, gonna I be some turbulence. Think, I, I, I just, I, I still cannot believe <laughs> that in 2020, we're still using the electoral college mm -hmm. and that people still with a straight face mm -hmm. will defend it as if it's not the racist construct that it is, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I, I'm just, it's, it's unbelievable to, ev mm -hmm. I mean, to, every, to every other person in the world, it's insane that, yeah. we, that as Democrats, you, we have to win uh, by at least seven right. points right. No. in order <laughs> to, to even actually have it. win an election? Right. It's fucking How does that make us. sense to anybody? So anyway, um, there's a great article on the on on why the electoral college uh, is actually racist. In mm -hmm. I think it was in the Washington Post this weekend or the weekend before or something like that. It's a great article. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I shouldn't even say that it's racist. It is it is a tool of the cast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is what it is. Totally. And even I mean, obviously there's a big racial component to it. But even I was just thinking the other day and like almost having like an anxiety attack thinking about like how how does anyone defend a system where I or someone or you or someone who lives in California or New York that our vote literally is it's it's almost if, if it weren't in the Constitution let's say we're a piece of legislation, it would be unconstitutional because it's basically a, a violation of like equal protection that your vote by living in one state literally matters less and counts less than the vote in another state. How does that, how right. is that allowed? I don't understand how that's allowed, yet it is. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm just more concerned that, yeah, I think, I think you said it's not even, it's not gonna end November 3rd. There's probably going to be at least days or weeks of Come on, I would yeah. I, I would say prepare for a long November. Yeah, <laughs> I would. No, I'm serious. You know, I don't think we learned. I don't think it was until the end of November that we knew about uh, Gore and Bush. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or even <laughs> I just watched. They just watched a CNN special about it. Um, I think the Supreme Court decision was in mid December. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. We were, we were going nuts. I think the only, um, I, think I, I could talk about this for hours, but you know, I think the only hope or the, uh, is if it's so, so decisive, if Biden wins Florida on election night, which you know, apparently they're, unless it's super close, you know, they count virtually all their votes on election night, oh, okay. Ohio. So, I mean, there's a chance that if it's so big that we will know on election night. Have you, played, have you played with that electoral uh, map in New York Times? Oh, yeah. I spent a good two hours with that and my vape. It got me through the weekend. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll tell you what's really I just, frightening. I just, I, I always enjoy my, my favorite part of that. And then I'll let you go. No, was, no. Um, was, was the, was um, bringing Texas into the blue. That was always fun. That always felt fun. Hey, I, it could happen. I mean, honestly, and that's, and I think they count virtually all their votes on election night. So, I mean, if that happens, then yeah, it's over. Um, I mean, I think we're, it's, it's with, it's like nine points. He's, right. he's, yeah. he's up by nine points there, but still for Texas, that's ridiculous that he's okay. doing, he's not doing as better than that. Right. Right. No. Um, but anyway, I'm so grateful to you for ta for doing this. And I you know really quickly, I just want to tell you, you know, 
I really admire that despite the fact that, you know, I know you were a big Bernie person like my mom in 2016. And if I'm, am I correct that you were for Warren in the primary? I was. Right. Um, so, you know, but uh, just like me, Biden was not my first choice. You know, I was a, a Pete and Kamala person. But, you know, for me, it was just, it's, it's so obvious that it was always obvious, that irregardless of who the nominee would be, that it was so obvious that we, we should all get behind whoever that person would be. Oh, and, I said it. Yeah. I said it when I when I said I was voting for Elizabeth Warren. Like when I posted that I was supporting Elizabeth Warren, I was like, I'm supporting Elizabeth Warren right now, but whoever wins, I'm in. Right. I mean, I'm, I was all in from the beginning. Right. There's no, we don't have the luxury right. to wait around for perfect. By the way, it's never going to show up. Yep. Because whoever yep. wins, we still have to hold them accountable. It doesn't yep. matter. Yep. So vote for the person who gets, who comes closest to your needs and of the people you love yeah. and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. You know, there's it no time, my there's mind. No, this is not the election to let your ego do the work. Absolutely. It's not about you. It's not about, uh, you know, being uh, pure or, you know, whatever, or like, you know, I just, I, don't exist. Exist. I still can't get over the fact I still hear people you know, it's not just, it's not just, it's, it's all people all over the map who'll say for one reason or another, you know, oh, you know, Biden's this or that, or, you know, I, not, I think most people I come into contact with uh, say they're going to vote for Biden, but it's, but it's still like with like a lot of like, a lot of uh, attitude, you know, attitude. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like one person is you know, the, about as like inoffensive and like sort of just, you know, and, and I love, look, I love the guy, but you know, he's, he's I, I don't want to be, he's a critical word. He's pretty inoffensive. He's kind of blind, you know, like very like, you know, who, who, who can be offended by Joe Biden? And yet he's up against, up against like a fascist wannabe dictator. And yet people are still like, I just, I just it's just mind blowing to me, you know? The undecided, the undecided. are my favorite. <laughs> My best friend and I, Trey, keep sending back and forth undecided memes. Let me see. If, I'm gonna find you one, and I'm gonna go. <laughs> but that's just I'm gonna show you the, the the last one I sent him, <laughs> which I thought was really good. Here it is. Where is it? An undecided voter. I dislike as an undecided voter. I dislike Trump's racism, incompetence, and cruelty. But he's the only candidate who used to have a board game named after him. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, that was Michael Ian Black's tweet. <laughs> uh, to, uh, that's, that's awesome. I mean, for someone to be undecided at this point, they probably are at that sort of level of uh, of intelligence or whatever, whatever. You know, I mean, honestly, I don't understand how it's even possible. But but anyway, thank you so much. Such an will honor. You give your pleasure. mama a big hug for me. I will, and hopefully see you in person one day soon. I love yes. it. Yes. And congrats on the show. Congrats on the new season. Thank and you. Hold down the fort over there for me, will you? You bet I will. You bet Come I will. On. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. You too.